so my job right now is to introduce to you the folks that are gonna level the playing field. So everybody at the conference has a, a sense of what all the sort of processes are behind the problem we're facing, the regulatory process, the, the legal process, some of the scientific, underlying scientific issues. This year, we've brought to the forum Meg Sears from Canada, uh, who has a background in bioengineering and biochemistry. She's got her PhD from McGill University, and now she serves as the chair of Pre uh, Prevent Cancer Now, which really is focused on eliminating the causes of preventable cancer. Um, so what better way to start this uh, with an activist, scientist activist from Canada who has been uh, instrumental in moving the country way ahead of the United States in terms of the adoption of pre preventive measures, uh, ordinances throughout the provinces that take uh, the pesticides like Irvine has done out of uh, land management. So Meg, if you could come up and we welcome you here from the other side of the border. There are no walls yet that separate us. So <laughs> we're happy to have you. Well, thank you so much, Jay. I'm, I'm, I must say I'm really honored and thrilled to be here. I know I, I've been working on pesticides issues for a long time and and Beyond Pesticides is a tremendous resource, and we're, you know, we are very grateful for all of the great things that you do. And so down here, looking across the unwalled border at greener pastures, you know, I do have to caution you that perhaps it's not quite as green over there as you'd, as you'd like to believe, but um, there, are, there are green spots, and so we will we'll, um, talk a bit about that. You know, I always want to step back and just try to really put things in perspective. Now, pesticides are the only chemicals that we have devised specifically to be toxic, specifically to kill things, and then we spread them in the environment. And most of it never gets anywhere near a, you know, its target, but um, it just seems like a very odd <laughs> perspective if, you know, when you stand back from that. These concerns are not new. Um, Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring in 1962. There's lots of people in this room who were but a glimmer in an eye, perhaps, at that time. Um, she, she wrote of a time when the insects and birds were gone as a result of pesticides. She was particularly concerned about DDT, and she happened to die of breast cancer, unfortunately, at 56 years of age. She says, what we do to our environment, we do to ourselves. We are not separate from our environment. Can I have the next slide, please? And of course, you know, just to remind us, DDT was good for me in our milk, our foods, and um, there was a great war on insects, and it was part of the you know, the big war effort to deal with lice and all sorts of things. A lot of people were very heavily exposed. And if the epigenetic effects are still there today, um, perhaps people are still being affected by DDT. When we're looking at the evidence that's needed to be um, put forward before we actually take action to ban something like DDT, ban, and DDT is banned in North America. It's still used um, in some developing countries to control mosquitoes. So thank God, in a way, a DDT thinned eggshells because DDT was banned to protect the plummeting populations of predatory birds. DDT is an established endocrine disruptor, but to give you an idea, if as often happens, we don't take action until we have human proof of harm. In just a few years ago, there was a report on a 50-year study of DDT, which confirmed that in utero exposure, increased risk of breast cancer. So if we're gonna sit around using a toxic chemical for 50 years before we collect enough information, we are literally exposing generations of children to toxic chemicals, and the numbers of these are not going down. So one of, the, one of my concerns is, how do we make these decisions? We make choices 
And when we get up, whether we're going to turn off the alarm clock, what we're going to put on our bodies, what we're going to eat. And as a society, we're making choices about what is in our environment. So that's what Prevent Cancer Now um, is working on and at a high level. But as I said, this is not new. So John Wargo, um, he wrote in 1998 that children are particularly at risk with our toxic um, legacy. And he talks about scientific uncertainty, how you deal with these persistent chemicals and the, their effects. The fact that they're mobile, they don't sit still. We put them in the environment and they take off. They go into the air, the water, the food. It's, you know, you can't keep track of them. Um, they're very complex exposures. And as Warren so beautifully pointed out, you know, even just two of them, which way is aromatase going to go if you have a mixture? So um, unfortunately in science, they'll say, well, we don't have consistent evidence, but if changes that are not controlled in your, in your study will change the evidence, um, we have to change our scientific framework. And as a, I have worked in this type of area in, um, you know, in, in the clinical side of things, but we have to translate this into, the, um, into our pesticide decision making. So John Wargo, was, um, his book was summarized in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It says, how should the fractured body of environmental law be repaired to manage this distribution of risk and benefits? You know, people bear the risks and the companies bear the benefits. So, what is the, what kinds of things are we seeing in our population? We have, we suspect that um, chemicals are changing chronic disease, and certainly pesticides aren't the only, you know, aren't the only chemicals of concern. But nevertheless, there's lots of really good reasons to think that we're going to have to switch up how we are dealing with chemicals in our environment pretty quickly because we can't afford for people to be getting so sick. So this is um, surveillance epidemiology and end results. This is the SEER data from the uh, states. It's um, from here, it's about 60% of your population. And this shows that um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is quite frequently associated with things like the phenoxy herbicides and the dioxins. Um, I hadn't planned on talking about that, but I can at some point fill you in on that story. Um, that's been going up for a long time. It started to kind of stabilize, it's scattered, and it's going up in all age groups. And then if you put on your epidemiological um, microscope, right down at the bottom there, we see that um, it's kind of hard to tell what's happening in the young people. But um, just last year it was published that for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or sorry, yeah, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and acute lymphoid leukemia, those in the, um, the young adolescents, 15 to 19 years of age, they have been going up steadily. So this is you know, trickling down through the entire age range, and everybody is getting more of these cancers. Now, they're rare cancers, so you don't see the bodies in the streets. But nevertheless, they're extremely expensive can cost Billion, a billion dollars just to develop one drug that may or may not um, be successful in these malignancies. In Canada, we see similar kinds of things. We're seeing that uh, lymphocytic leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or Hodgkin's lymphoma actually, they have been increasing in incidence in, um, in Manitoba. Manitoba has the longest standing um, health records data. It's kind of like Kaiser Permanente. They do some research using their health data. And um, in Canada, with our public health system, they, we have it's a provincial jurisdiction. So in Manitoba, they have the longest standing uh, set of data. So they can do the best analyses of this kind of thing. And once again, between 1984 and 2013, um, the incidence and in their survival has been um, uh, 
about the incidence. The survival has improved. We're getting better at treating it. But um, the incidence has increased steadily uh, um, for lymphocytic leukemia at 1.4% per annum. This is, again, American data, although it's been confirmed that we're seeing the same patterns in um, Canadian data. Um, is the most, um, there, there's a lot of data associated with this paper, but um, the brain and central nervous system tumors have been increasing in incidence. And when you dig into the data that is produced, it's the most aggressive ones that are increasing most quickly. And yes, there's some association with cell phone radiation. We also know that cell phone radiation um, accentuates the effects of toxic chemicals. We've got good research on that in animals. So um, in any case, it's not looking good for brain tumors in young people. Colorectal cancer is increasing. In Canada, in, amongst people 15 to 29 years of age, it's going up 6.7% per annum. And in, it's going up um, more slowly in older people. And we are seeing increases in excess weight. So this obesity, and um, I'm delighted that we're going to be hearing from Dr. Bloomberg about obesogens because they're very, very important. Um, so this is despite significant decreases in alcohol consumption, small increases in fruit and vegetable intake, and small increases in activity. So people are more, more people are doing what they're told is supposed to pre prevent this, and yet we're still seeing these increases. So it's not just eating your veggies and taking a walk. We see a lot of cancers that are associated with being overweight or obese. And interestingly, the obesogen explanation makes a heck of a lot more sense than the straight um, obesity leading to cancer. So the, the obesity, to my mind, is to a large extent a marker of the contamination that can be stored in adipose tissue, because a lot of these contaminants are fat soluble. So we're looking at meningioma again, um, adenocarcinoma, multiple myeloma, kidney cancer, cancer of the uterus, of the ovaries, colorectal cancer again, the pancreas, upper stomach, gallbladder, liver, breast, and thyroid. So a lot of these are hormonal related as well. And in Canada, we've got some really good news. Our cancer rates are kind of stable. This is incidence, age standardized in Canada. Um, but it's not the same across the board. So the tobacco related um, cancers are going down and the obesity related, obesogen related, perhaps, um, cancers are going up and the, and the endocrine related. Uh, cancers are going up. Inflammatory bowel disease. Um, again, there's uh, one thing that Prevent Cancer Now and other groups in Canada did. We put in an objection to the glyphosate um, re-registration. And the, one of the basis of that was that we went to the Pest Management Regulatory Agency in Health Canada. You can look at those confidential tests, the reports, and there was an awful lot of reports which were the, um, the, the key uh, sort of tipping point studies that were decision-making studies where they remarked on anal staining of the animals, but this was considered not to be adverse. So if it's not an adverse reaction, then it's not factored into the decision-making. So, you know, when we look at this, it's going up almost 5% per annum in youth under 16 years of age. Canada has a horrible um, distinction of being, you know, one of the top in the world for inflammatory bowel disease in children. And this is being driven by a 7% annual increase in the youngest, in the children, you know, five and under. So this is pretty dismal. And if those, that anal staining has anything to do with it, then we're, we're, we think that glyphosate has to... Um, go. Um, again, autism has been going up as of 2009. It, um, in this report from Nature, it had gone up to uh, one in 110 children. You know, starting off in 75 is one in 
5,000 children. Now, there's the reasons for all of this are not 100% clear. There has been some um, changes in diagnosis and sensitization of people, so they're looking for it and so on. But um, at least half of that is, is a very real um, increase. Then in um, earlier this decade, it went from 110, 1 in 110 to 1 in 100 and, oh, sorry, 1 in uh, 86. And then the dyslexia hit, and it became 1 in 68. And then just um, very recently, it was published um, by our public health um, agency that autism increases are not merely diagnostic changes. It's gone up to 1 in 66 Canadian children. So this is, uh, the, this is the increase from 2000 to 2015 in, um, this is the graph from Newfoundland. It's going up across the board. So at one, you know, I started off kind of giving you a sense that there's been a long-standing concern about pesticides. And the Ontario College of Family Physicians included, uh, well, it still includes a group of doctors who are very, very concerned and very active and run a clinic at the University of Toronto on environmental health. And so they said, we are certain that pesticides are making people sick. And then all hell broke loose for these poor doctors because the pesticide industry started challenging them on that. And, um, you know, well, these people can make the life of doctors who are mostly spending their time in clinics. They're very busy people, quite miserable. So these doctors, they said, well, you know, we have systematic methodology. We know how to do this. We're going to do a systematic review, which is what you do in medicine if you want to know whether a drug should be taken off the market because it causes too many heart attacks or whatever. So they set out and they did a systematic review of, um, and they did a methodologically really sound um, review. It's very well done. It's available online. and. Um, they, they proved, yeah, you know, if you look at these studies, pesticides that are commonly used are causing brain cancer, kidney cancer, you know, 11 out of 11 studies that they identified cause cancer. Both uh, of the studies that they identified um, harm the nervous system. There were neurodevelopmental effects or mental and emotional effects. And there were reproductive effects in 42 of the 50 studies. So they were, they were pretty proud of that. And um, it, it didn't quiet the pesticide industry. But nevertheless, it was a very strong study. And that made a difference, particularly in Ontario, where, where I come from. Um, you have to appreciate that in Canada, the, Quebec is a distinct society. That's what they call it. And pesticide regulation is, um, was taken on by the Quebec individuals. So the tiny little town of Hudson, Quebec, banned pesticides. It was largely the work of a very de dedicated physician who um, said, no, you know, my, my patients are getting sick. They're getting skin rashes. The children aren't healthy. We, we need to do things differently. That town of Hudson, tiny little town, was taken to the Supreme Court of Canada by the pesticide industry, and they were Fun, the, um, the town was uh, supported and represented by two of the major environmental law associations in, um, and they won. So, yeah, they won. And so what was really interesting was that they were told, the Supreme Court of Canada said, you don't need to prove this. Okay, thanks. You, you just need to, um, it, if this is done in good faith, you don't need to prove it. The pest, so they told the pesticide companies to quit bugging all these doctors. There were other studies, early exposures to hazardous chemicals. This was put out in 2011. And then in 2012, the family physicians were back again. And they looked at reproductive health, neurodevelopmental um, effects, and respiratory health outcomes. And once again, they found a lot of evidence that pesticides were causing problems. So in Canada, it's a lot like here. The feds, they set a bare minimum level of 
reasonable certainty of no unacceptable effects. This is not safe. In fact, it's actually illegal to advertise in Canada that a pesticide is safe, but the Health Canada uses the word, and then they're quoted by the, health, by the pesticide industry. Then the provinces license things, and then some provincial and local governments have banned some pesticides from lawns and gardens. Um, I'll talk a lot more tomorrow about how this decision making is made at the, you know, the science of that, but um, I, I'm sure that this will also be covered um, in the next presentation. Um, these regulatory lapses are common to other chemicals, and we're looking at that in Canada under the context of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Another thing that I'm working on is that for epidemiology, we've got lousy exposure data. This is one of the major problems with it. So uh, just to say that we are working on this environmental health um, information infrastructure. We have collaborators across the country in many different aspects. And I just wanted to thank you very much. Tomorrow I'll be talking in the morning, I guess, and can, we can um, carry on the conversation. And I'll tell you the dioxin story. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. And welcome to the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really pleased to introduce the next speaker because I've been working with Karen Cox for a long time. She's a staff scientist at the Center for Environmental Health, but we all knew her when she was the editor of the Journal of Pesticide Reform back 20 or so years ago, right? More than that. I won't tell. But um, Carolyn did some of the groundbreaking work in terms of translating science uh, for activism and advocacy. And to this day, there are fact sheets that she created that are used by advocates and adv activists. Um, so with that, I think, I think I'll stop there, so I'll give you more time to talk. So thank you, Carolyn, for coming. Welcome, everyone. Um, I wanted to start with 36. This is the 36th National Pesticide Forum. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> it's, um, it's really amazing. Um, and we are hitting you up this afternoon and this evening with a lot of bad news. Um, I have to say I'm going to continue with that. Um, but we will get to the good news before the night is over. So bear with me. Um, my presentation is called 10 Reasons Not to Use Pesticides. It's meant to just be a really simple introduction to why we don't need these poisons. Um, and 10 reasons, 20 minutes, hop on, let's go. Uh, so um, I'm going to start by uh, getting my timer going here. Uh, the very most important reason, pesticides don't solve pest problems. And before you say, hey, wait a minute, isn't that what they're supposed to do? Let's think about it. They kill pests, right? Some of them are really good at that, but that doesn't mean they solve pest problems. Um, so just looking at it from the big picture, we've been using chemical pesticides for over half a century. If they really solve pest problems, we wouldn't have any left, right? We wouldn't need to use them because all the pests were gone. And actually, pesticide use has gone down a teeny tiny bit in the last few decades, but it's still more than a billion pounds a year in the US. To me, that means they're not solving pest problems. Um, and just to give a specific example, this is um, glyphosate Roundup use in the US, which is shot up exponentially. You could maybe infer that it actually causes pest problems, and you actually wouldn't be too far wrong. Um, so how do we actually solve pest problems? Okay, in our house, 
We just keep the pests out. We put screens on our windows. We do caulking. Um, we put sweeps under our doors. We use that unpronounceable word, escutcheons, around our pipes so that pests can't use them as a highway. Um, we keep our food in jars so the pests can't get inside. Um, we don't leave our pets' food lying around to feed pests. Um, we don't provide water for our pests. So bathroom fans, fixing leaky pipes, it's all really important. Um, we clean maybe more and more carefully than we actually would do normally. So vacuuming, scrubbing, those kind of things. Um, and then in our garden or on a farm, um, it's the same principle. We want to solve the pest problem. We want to prevent the conditions that allow pests to thrive. Um, so there's the good bugs that eat the bad bugs. Um, compost creates healthy soils. Healthy soils mean healthy plants. Healthy plants resist pests. Um, we grow varieties that have fewer pest problems. Um, we use green manure crops to build that healthy soil that, again, means healthy plants and fewer pests. Um, diverse crops. So we're not just growing one thing. because um, That attracts the pests and allows them to multiply. Um, OK, so here we are at reason number two. Um, pesticides are not very good for us. Um, and um, I, I try to give people um, sort of hints, like if you're talking to your city council, your school board, your ag commissioner, whoever it is, um, here's some kind of credible things that you can say. Uh, first of all, EPA says they're not good for us. Now, I have to admit that they've taken this statement off their website. <laughs> um, in, since the current administration, it's now in their archive. It's still there. You can find it. But, um, and um, for really credible information, I think something that comes from a government agency is really helpful. Um, I find um, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health um, to have really useful information. That's NIOSH. Um, so what I did here was just um, pick the most commonly used herbicide, um, glyphosate, or Roundup. And NIOSH says, um, you know, it damages our genes, and it also causes birth defects. And of course, most people know that an international agency has now said that it causes cancer. Um, now, just looking at um, what EPA says is the most commonly used insecticide, some of their statistics are really old. Um, so this is chlorpyrifos, and NIOSH says, yes, it damages genes. Yes, it affects the development of the nervous system. Um, not fun. Um, and then here's the most commonly um, used fungicide, chlorothalonil. Fungicide means um, something you would use for plant diseases. Um, so it damages genes, affects fertility, causes birth defects, and causes cancer. Woo. <laughs> Let's go. Um, something else that I think is really important is that pesticides are especially problematic for children. Um, and, you know, we were all kids once. Most of us have kids or grandkids or have friends who have kids. Um, and we want to protect them. Um, so um, there's a couple important concepts about kids and pesticides. So for their size, kids drink more water and eat more food than adults. So if there are pesticides in that water or in that food, they're going to be exposed to more. Um, also, children are growing and developing so that um, if they're exposed to pesticides and those pesticides um, impact their growth and their development, those are lifelong problems that they're going to be living with. Um, 
another thing that we have really good data about is that um, pesticides often contaminate food. Um, so uh, every year, um, the uh, US Department of Agriculture does a study about pesticide residues in food. It takes them a couple years to get the data out. So we're looking at data from 2016. And in their um, study of common fruits and vegetables, um, these are foods that are prepared the way you and I would prepare them, so peeled or whatever it is, washed. Um, so um, well over half of the samples that they tested um, had more than one pesticide. Um, a good chunk had just one pesticide residue, and only about a quarter of the samples um, were free of pesticide residues. So um, basically, when you're eating, you are consuming pesticides. And eating is something we all got to do, right? It's not optional. <laughs> so um, just a few of the things that kind of bubbled to the top in this study. 94% um, of their applesauce samples contained at least one pesticide. Um, and you know, applesauce is something that we kind commonly feed to babies and kids, so I just wanted to highlight that one. And then if you want to be sure that you're getting your daily dose of pesticides, um, <laughs> I recommend frozen cherries. Um, <laughs> every single sample of frozen cherries that USDA tested had pesticides in it. Um, and if you do the fresh ones, um, it's almost as good, 95%. So, um, yeah, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Um, and the government is publishing these studies. It's not like we made them up, you know? <laughs> um, so um, the next thing is really, really important. So the people who are on the front lines for pesticide exposure in this country are farm workers and farmers. and. Um, this guy filling a tank um, is almost certain to be exposed to more pesticides than you are. Um, so um, there's a couple of just amazing studies that have looked at what happens um, when farm workers and farmers are exposed to pesticides. Um, so the Chamaco study is here in California. Um, what they did was um, gather um, a group of moms in the Salinas area and, that were pregnant, and um, they measured their exposure to pesticides by looking at um, what was in their urine. And then um, when the kids were born, they followed this, those children through their development to see what the effect of their mom's pesticide exposure was. And they found, you know, just this long list of really amazing stuff. Um, the thing that, you know, I keep coming back to is that, um, you know, lower scores on the IQ tests that those kids took. Like, that's something these kids are going to have to fight with all their life. Um, and. Um, a really interesting study, um, the, one of the newest things that the Chamacos study has published, they looked at the relationship between what they call adversity. What that means is kids who are hungry, um, kids who are homeless, kids who um, have some kind of difficult family situation, whatever it is, and those kids had more of an IQ loss than kids who had a more um, stable situation to live in. So pesticides are bad for you, yes. Um, but if you have a difficult life for other reasons, it's even worse. Um, and then um, there's a federal study called the Agricultural, Agricultural Health Study. Um, it's looking at farmers in North Carolina and Iowa and looking at pesticide exposure and then the health effects that follow. And um, it's 
been going for a really long time. Um, they found a whole bunch of health effects um, that are linked to pesticide exposure in these farmers. Um, the, the newest thing they found, they're just kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, you just kind of go, wow. Um, so they found that certain pesticides um, are um, uh, linked to the occurrence of arthritis, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, who would have thought, right? I mean, it's just like, um, wow. Yeah, what can I say? Um, so another thing we know about pesticides is that they're not good for pets. And lots of us care about our pets a lot. Um, so um, one thing is that pesticides are a common cause of pet poisonings. So um, this is from the uh, American Society of Prevention Cruelty to Animals, the Pet Poison Control Center. Um, so insecticides are num number seven on the list for what causes pet poisonings. And rodenticides, which are those pesticides that kill rats and mice, they're number eight. And it's not just poisonings. Um, it's also chronic health problems. This is a really old study, but one of my favorites. Um, so pets, dogs, <laughs> who grow up um, in a house where the lawn is treated with pesticides are at higher risk for cancer. Like, isn't that amazing? <laughs> I mean, just um, uh, not surprising, um, just what Meg just told you, how many links there are between um, pesticides and cancer, but you can even see it in the pets. Um, and so um, then just um, a few more things here. Pesticides contaminate water. Um, the US Geological Survey um, has been looking at pesticides in water for decades. They're kind of out of funding right now, but the cumulative picture of what they studied over the last couple decades, basically, when they look at streams, they find pesticides in 90% of what they test. And um, so mostly um, like any stream in an agricultural area and any stream in an urban area, you're gonna find pesticide residues. Um, I guess it's like you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> that's, um, another thing that's really and really important is, you know, it's not just us, it's all of the other critters um, on the planet um, that are impacted by these chemicals. Um, so I want to quickly run through um, what I did before about, you know, the most commonly used pesticides. Um, so the most commonly used herbicide, Roundup. Um, many of these products are quite toxic to fish. Uh, chlorpyrifos, which I mentioned earlier, the most commonly used insecticide. Um, Boy, it's toxic to a bunch. Um, birds, fish, aquatic insects, uh, bees, um, take your pick. Um, and then chlorothalonil, um, the fungicide, um, it's actually um, pretty to quite toxic to fish and um, impacts uh, reproduction of birds. Um, and all this information that I just ran through, that's on the um, label of the pesticide. Um, so um, I know nobody reads labels, but there it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess you call that a credible source, the pesticide label. Um, so I want to just take a step back. Um, we can't talk about pesticides without talking about Rachel Carson. Um, she is, um, I would say, the reason why we're all here. Um, she started this movement, um, and sometimes people forget that what actually um, brought her to study pesticides was actually the effects of DDT on birds. Um, and from that, she moved on to you know, health effects and other things, but um, it was the stories about birds getting sick 
after DDT applications that really grabbed her and um, she didn't want to do it, but she had to write that book because it grabbed her so much. So, um, you know, just like I said, without her, we wouldn't be here. Um, so any of you who've been involved in pesticide controversies have probably heard something similar to, well, doesn't the government say they're safe? We wouldn't use them if they weren't approved by the government. Um, and so there's a really important contradiction here that I think we all need to focus in on. Um, so people think that the government tests pesticides. And for the most part, that's actually not true. So who tests pesticides? Well, you know, Dow, DuPont, Monsanto, Syngenta, all of our friends. Um, hmm. And who profits from the sale of these pesticides? Those companies, right? So is it surprising that they would produce studies showing that their products are safe? I mean, <laughs> is there any reason why they would produce information showing that there's a problem um, so it's kind of a classic case of the fox guarding the hen house. Um, and it's, it's a real conflict of interest. And I think um, the only real resolution to it is, hey, um, let's find sustainable pest management techniques that don't need them, and we won't need to test them, and we won't have this conflict of interest. Um, you can see there's some white space in my slide, and that's because these companies keep merging, and so <laughs> sooner or later, there's just going to be one company up there, right? OK, so um, here we are at um, reason number 10. And I think I have like one minute left or something. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart and I think really important. So there's just too many secrets about pesticides. So um, just think about it. Um, uh, what pesticides were used on your block in the last six months? Nobody knows, right? Um, when were they used? How much were they used? Most of us have no idea. Um, and even if we knew the answers to those questions, we still wouldn't know what we'd been exposed to because most of the ingredients in pesticides are um, called secret by the manufacturers. They're not on the label, and it's really, really hard to find out um, what they are. Um, so um, this is... Um, if anybody tells you that the product that they're using is safe, ask them what's in it. <laughs> and if they can't give you that answer, which they won't be able to, say, how do you know it's safe if you don't know what's in it? It's really, it's a basic problem. Um, so um, I want to leave you with my parting message. Um, we don't need these pesticides. There are lots and lots of successful ways to manage pests without poisons. And that's why we're all here. And that's why, <laughs> despite all my bad news, there's actually good news coming. And thank you very much. OK, thank you, Carolyn. We're now moving to Melinda Himmelgarn, who is a registered dietitian and a investigative uh, dietitian. So she's, or, or nutritionist, I should say, investigative nutritionist. So Melinda's really active in trying to get the uh, nutrition community to focus on this issue as part of, a food, as part of the food safety issue. Um, but most importantly, Melinda spends about a day a week uh, with her radio show, Food Sleuth Radio, and interviews national experts in agriculture, in food, on pesticides, and 
she basically advances this concept of food truth. So thank you, Melinda, for being here. Well, I, I have to follow up uh, for those two great presentations that both mentioned Rachel Carson. And we could not uh, have found a better weekend to meet because tomorrow is the 54th anniversary of her death. So yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, I take my role as a registered dietitian really seriously because I think it's really important to me to help people eat well. And to do that, we have to produce food that is raised without poison. Many years ago, oh, I'm being told that I have to stand by here. OK, sorry. Um, I, many years ago, I was doing work with childhood obesity, and I became trained in media literacy because I knew that there was something besides just eating more fruits and vegetables and watching less TV that was having an impact on kids. So I'm going to bring media literacy into the pesticide picture. Because if we're going to change the way we use pesticides and the way we eat, then we have to change the way we think about pesticides. And so I want to, I think this is the good news part in that it's empowering because it gives us the ability to look at the way pesticides are framed. It enables us to look at our cultural narratives around pesticides. All right, let's see here. Here we go. Um, just to give you my frame of reference, I live in this middle section of the country, right where that blue star is in the state of Missouri. And I know I grew up in New York. I know that people in California and New York have no idea where Missouri is. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> But you can see this brown area is where there is the highest amount of use of glyphosate. So here, California and Missouri have a lot in common. But it's this middle swath of our country where soy and corn are largely produced. Genetically engineered soy and corn, genetically engineered to be resistant to glyphosate, and now because of glyphosate-resistant weeds, 2,4-D and dicamba. You know, we call this the flyover zone, literally. And what isn't being sprayed by an airplane is being uh, spread on the ground this way. What's at stake is what I love so much, and that is our water. Our rivers and streams, there's glyphosate in our rainwater in the Midwest. So why media when we're talking about health and we're talking about science? I love the quote by Reed Hunt, who was the former Federal Communications Commission chairman. And he said, the media's significance and clout comes from its near ubiquitous, pervasive power to completely alter the belief of every American. We swim in media, but we think that we are immune to its effects. That's the other guy. I'm smarter than that. I can figure this out. But let me just share with you the power of an ad. And this was taken from Will Allen's excellent book titled The War on Bugs. But the Pesticide Action Network did some research. And they found that you know Dr. Seuss, before he did Green Eggs and Ham and the Cat in the Hat, he was doing uh, commercials and uh, cartoon campaigns for FLIT, a pesticide. And they discovered that Dr. Seuss's cartoon campaign increased pesticide use tenfold by the nation's families. If advertising didn't work, advertisers wouldn't spend $5 million for a 30-second ad for the Super Bowl. There wouldn't be $1,000 price tags on billboards on the highway. Advertising works, and it's expensive. So who creates these ads? These ads are created by public relations firms. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first is Porter Novelli. They build themselves as a global public relations leader. Look what they say about their work. We motivate people to change deeply ingrained behaviors rooted in cultural and social norms. Our results are greater than influencing people. We make them believe. Catch them. This is a, a public relations firm that does a lot of work with food and agriculture, agribusiness. And they say what they do is they help food executives build trust and enhance the bottom line. And I want to give a shout out for US Right to Know. I know Carrie Gillum is here. 
But it is a fantastic organization, and there's a link. I can provide the exact link for you if you can't find it, but there's a video showing Ketchum's bragging about a campaign that they used to promote genetic engineering and the safety of it. So what are these persuasive techniques that are used to get well-meaning, well-intentioned people to make the wrong choices? Well, simple, easy solutions. We're human beings. We all want the simple, easy way. Testimonials. Testimonials, if I can do it, you can do it. Usually, testimonials are delivered most effectively by celebrities or people who look just like us. And then there's emotion. You know, you think you make a rational decision, but really most of our decisions are based on emotion. And the emotion that's used against us largely is one of fear. So for example, this was a billboard that I saw in, um, let's see, is the red dot? Yeah. This was a billboard that it was in, it was in the uh, Washington DC airport. Nine billion people, oh my god, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed all these people? Um, and so, that's fear generated. It's through biotechnology, of course, pesticides to feed the world. Nostalgia is another persuasive mechanism. And the most recent presidential election used nostalgia perfectly. Make America great again. It's very effective. Everyone is doing it. This is called bandwagoning. And we don't like to be left out of what the rest of the, pe what the, rest of the people like us are doing and scientific support, right? Science is driving our decisions. In the dietetics community, we have to have evidence-based scientific information. But remember, there used to be a time when doctors sold cigarettes, and now we have scientists selling us herbicides. All right, let's take a look at some of these examples more closely. Greater profits, easy money. Who doesn't want this? I've had conventional farmers explain to me that their friend at church, who also happens to sell herbicides, will tell them, spend a dollar on this product and you'll earn two. Who can resist that? Farm Journal, wonderful publication to look at to see how pesticides and herbicides are sold to well-intentioned farmers. Here are two farmers that look just like my neighbors in the Midwest who are farming. And they say, I will get herbicide-resistant weeds under control. I will use multiple herbicides. And indeed, they will. Because if according to Monsanto's plan, this is from a New York Times article um, in October of 2016, Monsanto plans to have corn seed of 2025 having 14 traits that will allow the sprays of five different herbicides. Five. And that's just seven years away. Emotion, here's the little girl. And all of these ads are by design. There was a table where executives sat around and said, we need, a, we, need a, we need a child. It should be a girl. She should have blonde hair. And we'll reflect her in her father's eye. This is an example of emotional selling of Enlist, which is glyphosate plus uh, 2,4-D. I was trying to clean out my office, trying being the key word, and I found an old food biotechnology communications plan designed for dietitians by the International Food Information Council. And I thought, boy, that's odd. Look at that image, a nostalgic image. But what they're telling us is how to talk to consumers about biotechnology and all the benefits. So as much as images matter, language matters too. And I don't know how many of you subscribe to The Sun magazine, but I absolutely love it. And there was an interview with Eddie Ellis, who was a former Black Panther leader, and he said, you know, if, if we're going to change people's thinking, then we have to change the language that they use. So let's think about some of the language that we see in the news media. Organic versus modern agriculture. I called the Soybean Association based in St. Louis because I wanted to see if they had any information on growing organic soybeans. And they said, uh, no, we don't have anything like that. We just have modern agriculture information. <laughs> Pesticides sound poisonous because they are, but crop protection doesn't. Crop protection sounds like a good thing. 
Chemlon in my community just switched their name to True Green. They're spraying the same chemicals on my neighbor's lawn, but it's got a different, more friendly name. And the National Agricultural Chemical Association is now called Crop Life America. <laughs> so be aware, be mindful of the language that we use. It's very powerful. Dow and DuPont, Carolyn had that great sign with all the, the companies merging. Dow and DuPont have a new name. Their agri-science division is going to be called Corteva. How did they come up with this name? Well, it's half the, the word heart from Latin and half nature from Hebrew. What is their commitment? To growing progress, taking farms and farmers, helping them flourish, moving our world forward. These are all positive words in our vernacular. Media does two things. It both reflects and creates our culture. So if you pick up a farming magazine, you will see many ads like this. It's man against nature. It's man fighting weeds. Here's a, a, a recent publication from the Minnesota Soybean Association, and you can see our heroes in the fields are facing a formidable foe. These pests and weeds must be eradicated. There's also this notion that if there are weeds in a field, that the field is dirty. And farmers in the Midwest like to have clean fields. So this is a highly effective ad, and if you can't read that, it says, use Tricor herbicide pre-plant and avoid planting into a dirty field of weeds. And how many consumers look for the perfect fruit or the perfect vegetable, no scars, no marks on it. This feeds into our need for perfect fruit, and therefore, we need a spray to do that. We're told that herbicides are smart. <laughs> We're told that herbicides are modern and advanced. This is the Extend soybeans. These are the ones with dicamba resistance as well as glyphosate. It's sort of like going from using a shovel to using a snowblower. And of course, modern agriculture, as defined by Monsanto, is sustaining the bond with Mother Nature. This is Enlist. This is, again, Enlist is 2,4-D and, and uh, uh, glyphosate. And here you can see this lovely nostalgic image of the grandfather, the father, and the son. Your farm is telling a story. This is protecting what's important to move farming ahead. And you can't go to an agriculture meeting or go to a lecture at, an, at a college, a land-grant college, where there's an ag science department and not have somebody talk about population and feeding the world. You can get it on belt buckles. You can get it on guns. You can get it on caps. It's, the message is ubiquitous. But we also have to reach the younger generation, don't we? So here are some biotechnology coloring books. These are developed by the Council for Biotechnology Information. There's no mention of herbicides. It's all about feeding the world affordable food, and aren't farmers great who take this modern approach? There's a video game called Gardening Mama, and it shows children that they should use a spray to squash those viruses. There's actually free curriculum that's been developed by the Crop Life Ambassador Program. Very consistent messaging. This is, I believe, for fifth through seventh graders. So it's free. You can have an ambassador come to your classroom and talk to your classes while you take a break. They talk about science, herbicides, providing affordable food, feeding planet Earth. Without herbicides, we couldn't grow as much food. That pests can destroy a farmer's crop. These, these common themes keep coming up. And you can go online, Crop Life Ambassador, and you can get their, uh, their presentations are available. There are also scholarships provided to schools to help kids get, get to college. And it's kind of hard to bite the hand that feeds us, isn't it? When schools are hurting so desperately for resources. Dow was generous enough to give $3 million to the new Science Teachers Academy. 
And this, this was sponsored by the United Soybean Board. Why? Because they wanted to help teachers get the correct information about biotech into the classroom. Do you think herbicides would be part of the topic and birth defects and all of the cancers that we've been talking about earlier? There are university affiliations. Um, I used to be in the nutrition department at the University of Missouri. There's a Monsanto auditorium. There's a, a, the uh, Life Sciences Business Incubator at Monsanto Place. A lot of money exchanges hands. And this is just one example. I don't think there's a land-grant college out there that doesn't have some relationship with agribusiness. And then as a registered dietitian, well, we don't study agriculture, which is quite foolish. We don't study soil science, so we're relatively vulnerable. But I can tell you that we all care very much about feeding the world, about not having hungry kids. So when Monsanto comes along and has a 17-page advertorial in the online version of Today's Dietitian magazine, we read it and we believe it. And then we have webinars for dietitians. The Produce for Better Health Foundation partnered with the Alliance for Food and Farming. Their message to us is to make sure that consumers are not afraid of herbicides. And I'm here to tell you that we should be afraid for all the reasons that were outlined earlier. They tell us reasons not to use the dirty dozen list. My only problem with the dirty dozen list is that it doesn't address farm worker exposure. It's just what's on our plate. But it's all, look at the images that are used, a mom and a child, right? It's all about trustworthiness. And here they even have a couple of slides. Did you know that teens can consume 395 servings of nectarines and 206 servings of peaches without any effect, even if they're both, even if they both have highest pesticide residue recorded for nectarines and peaches by USDA? So it's OK. Don't worry about it. So we need to use media literacy in terms of we need to be thinking critically. How do we do that? Every message that you see, whether it's about pesticides or food or regardless, we need to ask certain basic questions. The questions are, who owns the message? Who profits from the message? Who is delivering that message and why? Which persuasive techniques are used? What's missing from the message? Is there a hidden cell? What are the alternatives? And what are the unintended consequences for any of our choices? And I want to recommend Spinning Food. It was a, a publication by the Friends of the Environment, Friends of the Earth, excuse me. And they give you a list of all of the organizations that sound great, US Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, for example, how much money they spent, over $26 billion. Who are their corporate board members or donors? Monsanto, Dow Chemical, DuPont. And what is their issue focus? Defending GMOs, pesticides, routine antibiotic use in livestock. We need to look at what is presented and what is reality. Caroline said, you know, who reads the label? I read the label. So I looked at this beautiful ad that was, uh, that was developed for Headline. It's a fungicide widely used in the Midwest. Funny, they have a little girl in the cornfield again, this image of happiness, purity, innocence. And then I look at the label, and my gosh, I don't want her in that field. Hazardous to humans and domestic animals, warning, maybe, maybe fatal if swallowed, avoid contact, and so on. So we have to look at the message that's given to us by a really slick public relations firm, and then we have to look at what the reality is. This is a real sign in Arkansas. Arkansas lost so many soybeans due to dicamba drift. Who's behind this sign? And what's going to happen if it's used? And it's going to be used this, this spring and early summer. Well, I can tell you what happens with uh, peach trees. Now, peaches are one of those foods that I would not like to live a summer without a peach. How about you? They're delicious. They are a medically important food. They're nutritious. They're tasty. Extendamax, which is the dicamba plus glyphosate, 
There was a student of Kevin Bradley's at the University of Missouri who did a series of uh, drift experiments on peach trees. And you can see minimal drift, a little bit more, and enough to kill the plant. With damaged peach trees, we don't get peaches. We won't have tomatoes. We won't have grapes. We won't have all the foods that all the cancer societies tell us to eat more of to prevent cancer. And by the way, uh, farmers are being offered $6 per acre cash reward for using this poison. Grow your incentives, not weeds, they say. The Minneapolis Star Tribune back in 2015 had an, uh, a headline that stopped me in my tracks. It said, in farm country, tainted water is just the way it is. <laughs> just the way it is. Water is such a source of summer pleasure, let alone being our most critical nutrient. What if for next summer our children couldn't go down that slide? What if they couldn't swim? What if they couldn't kayak and canoe? What if they couldn't catch fish and eat those fish? That is a tragedy. So I want to leave you uh, my final slide with a Missouri native, Mark Twain. He says, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. <laughs> Thank you.